join me in our call to worship. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we do wait quietly for your salvation, but we wait with great confidence because you are above all things and you were before all things and you will see all things through to a good end for your people, for those who love you. We pray for our world and we are grateful for the ability to gather even now. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All the confession this morning comes from Psalm 31, verses 9 and 10. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning echoing the But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine upon your servant. 
Save me in your steadfast love. Our reflection passage this morning comes from Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Let's pray. Father, you and you alone are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. You are our loving Father and deserving of our worship, obedience, and service. Thank you for you and your words of encouragement in Isaiah to not be fearful because you are with us. We ask that your promise to strengthen, 
walk with and help us by your righteous right hand during our days on this earth would inspire and empower us to be salt and light to others. Lord, bring this passage and others like it to our attention over this next week. To be your child, a sheep under your care, is both humbling and an undeserved, wonderful blessing. We come to you, Father, with our concerns and needs. We pray for Lee and Emma serving you in North Africa. Lord, bless their efforts to share the gospel. Protect and bless them as they seek to establish relationships in order to make disciples of Jesus. We pray for our deacon, Jeff Hartman, his wife, Becky, and their children. Give Jeff and our deacons wisdom to effectively meet the needs brought before them. Father, we ask you to guide the deacons during this season of the coronavirus in a way that would allow SDPC to be a good example of Christian love and help to those in need. We pray your blessing upon Dan Whitley and his family. Guide Dan as he leads our children's ministry. Lord, we ask your blessing upon our children. May you cause the lessons learned at church and home to draw our children to love and serve you. Father, for those in our church family that are sick, unemployed, or underemployed, we ask you to move in powerful ways to comfort, provide, and assure them of your presence as you have described in Isaiah. We ask that you would comfort the Robbins family as they mourn the loss of Jamie's mother. Father, as Bruce opens the scriptures to us, open our minds and hearts to hear from you this morning. Give him your power. Bring the truth of your word to us this day in a life-changing way. Lord, we are privileged to give back to you a small portion of what you have given to us. May you use these small gifts to spread your kingdom, and may we do it in ways that are pleasing to you. Hear us now, Father, as we pray in the way you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our threats as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our text today is Psalm 19. Read with me. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has sent, set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs his course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, greetings, dear brothers and sisters gathered around town or scattered about town. Though we're apart physically and I miss you, I praise God that we live in a time when we can gather virtually. And I hope that even now as we use technology to sing together and to pray together, to listen to God's word together, I hope that we remember that the unity we share in Christ is more real than any physical gathering. And while we do look forward to gathering together at South Dayton Presbyterian Church as soon as the Lord allows, let's be reminded that this time of waiting is something of a metaphor. It's kind of a living lesson for another deep truth. And that is that for the Christian, this world is not our home and it can't satisfy. We're just passing through it and it itself is passing away. These are hard times and there may be harder times ahead, but don't fear, your king has conquered death itself. So what can separate you from his love now? It's hard not to settle for just existing right now, to say just getting through the day is enough. And some days it may be, but not every day. 
God is more powerful than that, and he's calling you to more than that. So don't waste these days, but use them to hear God teaching you again, not to put your hope in comfort or security or health, which we've seen can be taken away in an instant, but in God himself who gives us all things and who governs all things well. All right, today it's my joy and privilege to look with you at Psalm 19, which we just read. This is a majestic psalm, and I suspect that many of you who read it, who read it with me, were immediately familiar, at least with parts of it. Mike prays the final verse often before preaching, and I can't read verses 7 through 11 without hearing in my mind the beautiful sounds of the band a cappella who set this psalm to music and helped me memorize the words years ago. I hope as we study together this morning, you'll come away with a greater love for this psalm, just as I have while preparing our message. The psalm breaks down fairly neatly into three sections, followed by that last one-verse prayer that serves kind of as a coda or an epilogue. Your Bible probably puts double spaces between each of these sections, and that's how we're going to proceed today. We're going to look at God as our good creator, God's word as our good guide, and how God himself meets our deepest need. So first, God is our good creator. David, who wrote this psalm, starts right out of the gate with soaring language. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Verse 5 reminds us that while we too often complain and mope, sinfully failing God and our neighbor, nature doesn't. Each day the sun joyfully rises to obey the one who made it, perfectly doing its master's bidding and blessing humanity in so doing. I experienced just that last week driving to work when we used to drive to work, in all this coronavirus chaos and difficulty, I saw a spectacular sunrise. The sky was on fire, and its beauty, painted by God himself, surpassed that of a da Vinci masterpiece. And of course, the sunrise is just one example of God's glory in creation. Some of you know that Laura and I met working on a rural ranch in Montana the summer after college. If you've seen the movie A River Runs Through It, we were maybe 100 miles from where that was set. So if you were to craft an idyllic setting for a summer courtship, that would be the place to do it. All the workers camped out together a lot, and the weather was so perfect you didn't need a tent. There was zero light pollution. Nights were just pitch black when the moon wasn't up, and there were so many stars, I think I got an idea there of what Abraham must have seen when God took him outside and said, count them. This is the number of children I'm going to give you. We were young enough then that we could travel long distances on our days off. We saw Glacier National Park and the Tetons. If you haven't seen them, they will take your breath away, and they should. Out there every day holds the potential to see the best of what nature can offer. One afternoon, while about 20 of us were stacking hay in a meadow, we looked across a canyon and we saw an eagle and a hawk dogfighting over territory. That, for me, is one of those events that the poet Wordsworth referred to as a spot of time. I'll never forget it. I used to have an office that looked over the flight line on a fighter base where F-15s who were taking high-performing airmen on what we called incentive rides would scream along the runway and then would go vertical right in front of me. That was impressive, but it paled in comparison to seeing those birds. So I will tell you, if you don't glimpse the majesty, the glory of God in his creation, it's not because God hasn't shown it forth. The problem is with you. Stay with me here for a minute. This morning's message is going to get a little tough, but it's going to be deeply hopeful by the end. And it seems like, perhaps particularly over these last few days and weeks, we could all use real, true hope. We've talked about verses 1 and 5 and about how the sun and the sky themselves prove God's glory. The three verses between them tell us that every day testifies to God's glory in creation, and every night responds with an amen. Verses 3 and 4 put a fine point on that, saying that the whole earth hears this song again and again. Our text says there is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice, that is, the voice of every day and every night, crying out, God made us and his handiwork is glorious. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. David's really emphasizing this point. Nature declares that there is a good and glorious God who created everything. Those of you who know your New Testament probably hear the Apostle Paul's words echoing in your mind. So listen now to Romans 1, 18 to 21, the introduction to that famous and terrible passage that details the descent of man into the fullness of his rebellion against God. 
For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. These verses from Romans are a direct parallel to Psalm 19, and I'm fairly confident Paul had that psalm in mind when he wrote his words to the church at Rome. He understood why people can look at the surpassing beauty of the stars or mountains like the Rockies, or see the miracle of a child's birth, or study the incomprehensible complexity of a single strand of DNA and still declare there is no God. It's emphatically not because there isn't enough evidence or because people haven't seen enough evidence. No, Paul agrees with David when he says in verse 20 of Romans 1 that God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. We all see it, and we all know what we're seeing deep in our souls. It's as plain as day, and children get it. Verse 21 explains the situation. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And for this, Paul says, they are without excuse. This is the issue. We can't plead ignorance. God has shown us such glory in creation and made it obvious that only an eternal, powerful God could create this majestic universe, that anyone who denies this hasn't reached an intellectual conclusion. He's made a willful decision, a moral choice. He's a rebel, a God unto himself. Ultimately, everyone believes in God. Everyone knows this universe didn't just happen. Paul is stark in his assessment. Anyone who claims to believe there is no God is lying either to you, himself, or both. He's suppressed what he knows because he believes the alternative, a life that honors God and overflows with thanks to him, might cost him more than he's willing to pay. There are some real life examples of this deep knowledge, even among well-known public atheists, and here I credit John Piper for the references. Richard Dawkins, the British professor in 2006, who wrote The God Delusion, and then followed up just last year with Outgrowing God, a beginner's guide, says this, quote, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose, end quote. Francis Crick, who co-discovered DNA, went even further saying, and again I'm quoting, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved, end quote. These two men are proving Paul's point and David's. The reality of creation is obvious, and it commends itself to anyone with eyes to see. It takes work to be an atheist, to see the heavens and still deny God. Make very sure to constantly suppress that truth. Tell yourself it can't be. Tell yourself you've outgrown the myth. Tell yourself you know better. Tell yourself all these things and hide your eyes from the glory all around you. That's what it takes not to believe. You might as well believe that I don't have a mother as that the stars don't have a creator. No, this is an irrational conclusion, as silly as trying to find a number on a number line that doesn't have one before it. It's as impossible as finding a turtle on a fence post and assuming no one put it there. For David and for Paul, God's existence and his power in creation are more self-evident than the truths in our Declaration of Independence. And as an aside, but an important one, if you do not believe in a creator, then A, you think you are smarter than our founders who wrote that all men were created equal, and B, you really have no grounds to believe that all men are equal. Western democracy and human rights cannot and do not exist for long without a consistent belief in a creator. And it's no coincidence that the most atheistic societies have been the most brutal on human rights, from revolutionary France to communist China. God gives us value, God declares us equal, and God makes us free. Well, we could go on and on here arguing the point, or we could spend the rest of our time just reveling in the goodness, the wonder of God in creation. And sometimes that is good for our souls. But here, David in the psalm doesn't do that, and he doesn't for a good reason. 
he knows that while this truth, that God is a good creator, this truth is a bedrock for understanding life and the world, it's not enough for understanding life and the world. That's because David knows that we can believe that God is, and that he's good, and that he's powerful, and we can still miss the mark. The second part of Psalm 19 demonstrates this. Verses 7 through 11 move from rejoicing in God's good creation to rejoicing in God's good law. Note what this means. While David praises God as creator, he doesn't say that this knowledge of God as creator is the best it gets. Rather, it's a starting point. But knowing that we have a good creator, acknowledging that God made all things isn't enough. No, it's the law of God that revives the soul, gives us wisdom, makes our heart rejoice, and opens our eyes. Let the words of our passage roll over you. Listen to this. The law of the Lord is perfect. It is sure. His precepts are right. His commandment is pure. His words are true. I'm a lawyer, and I've had a happy career in the law. I love the law. In our country, law gives ordered liberty, which is a rich blessing that few in history have tasted. I also love working for the Air Force because over two decades of both criminal and civil practice, I've had the good fortune never to argue a single cause I thought unjust. Not many lawyers can say that. I can, and I praise God for it. I love the law, and I've seen it work for good. But even with the career I've had, striving for justice, winning cases, seeing the right prevail, I wouldn't for a minute tell you that our law is perfect. Judges make mistakes, and a few are dishonest and corrupt. People in my profession twist the law and distort the truth to help criminals escape the consequences of their actions or to help the rich oppress the poor. Others work to help the poor take advantage of the rich. Victims aren't always or even often made whole by jury verdicts, no matter how much money they get in a civil trial or how much jail the wrongdoer gets in a criminal trial. Even Atticus Finch, the lawyer from To Kill a Mockingbird that every one of us in my profession wants to be, couldn't save Tom Robinson from the corruption in the legal system. Friends, praise God that his law isn't like that. Every decree he utters is good and wise, and he has the power to enact them all. He doesn't lie. He doesn't err. And then look at verse 11 of our psalm. In keeping God's law, there is great reward, it says. What earthly magistrate promises that? If you don't murder, no one says, good job. If you don't steal, people don't say, here, take this gift with my thanks. If you don't speed, the insurance bill you pay might come down a little, but you're still the one paying. But God says to those who obey, well done, good and faithful servant. Have this robe, that's Revelation 6, 11. Live in my house, that's John 14, 2. Eat at my table and drink my wine, that's Matthew 26, 29. Have my peace and my joy forever, Matthew 25, 21. Now, this is a different kind of law. It's superior in every way to the best earthly law given by one who is superior to every earthly law giver. You know, God's law, which David knew only from the first five books of the Old Testament, possibly a little more, and which we now have in the fullness of the entire Bible, God's law is a remarkable thing. Consider the fact that it talks so much about itself as being perfect. Besides David here and in Psalm 139, Peter said that the word of the Lord endures forever. That's 1 Peter 2, 5, or 125, excuse me. God himself said his word doesn't ever fail to do what he intends it to do. That's Isaiah 55, 11. Paul told Timothy that the scripture was breathed out by God himself, perfect for everything we need to do what is good. That's 1 Timothy 3, 16. Again, Paul, writing to the Ephesians under the inspiration of God's spirit, when he was describing the unseen struggle between good and evil forces in the universe and the way we join that battle, commends truth and righteousness and faith and peace as the various means we have to endure and survive attacks from those spiritual enemies. But he says the way to fight back, the way to gain ground in this cosmic war, is by the word of God, the law of the Lord. The author of Hebrews may have had Psalm 19 in mind when he wrote in chapter 4, verse 12, that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible is pretty serious about the Bible. This book revealed to us as God's law by God, it's precious to us. 
The Bible is also deeply offensive to those who don't believe. I experienced this fairly starkly in my sophomore year in college at a school that was still nominally Christian at the time. I took a New Testament class, and my professor was, as I understand it, a pastor in the mainline Presbyterian church. I enjoyed the class. I was doing well in it. When I left school in the spring, I left with a high B or an A in the class. So I was shocked when I got my report card that summer, and I had earned a C plus in the course. I called the professor, and I asked him what had happened. He told me it was my final paper. I had earned a D. I was confused, and he agreed to mail me the paper with his comments. The topic of my paper was the inerrancy of Scripture, the, the proposition that Scripture is without any flaw. To evangelicals, this is not a controversial or negotiable topic. But I found out then it was very controversial and non-negotiable, but in a different way for those outside Orthodox faith. I hadn't argued in that paper that the Bible was inerrant, though I certainly believe that then as I do now. Rather, I had argued the more modest position that the Scripture itself teaches the doctrine of scriptural inerrancy. You don't have to believe that's true, but it seemed to me reasonably straightforward just to discern that the Bible makes that claim about itself. My professor's final comment was remarkable. He wrote in a margin note, I would have failed you for your thesis, that is, the proposition that Scripture claims to be divinely inspired or to be the very word of God. He said, I would have failed you for your thesis, but your paper was too well written. Now think about that. He didn't refute what I said, and he all but admitted he couldn't. A paper can't be particularly good if it's arguing only balderdash. No, he said, if you believe in my class that inerrancy is even claimed by God's word, I want to fail you, and I will punish you regardless of the quality of your work. So why do I recount that sad event? It's for this reason. The word of God, as we read in Hebrews, really does divide. It cuts to our heart. It makes claims on us. In it, God says, believe me, worship me, obey me. But just like the stars and the sunrise say to us, God is and God is great, and yet people can suppress that truth, so also the word of God says, God is, he loves you, and he is to be trusted and obeyed. And people tragically say, no. If that's you, repent. Take God at his word. If you've been kidding yourself, if you've been playing around with God's word, treating it lightly, turn. God's law is good. It is balm for our souls. In it, we find life and joy and peace. And in it, you will find life and joy and peace. David gets this. He gets it deeply. That's why he can say God's law is to be desired more than gold, that it's sweeter to him than honey. Now stop for a moment and ask yourself, is that the way you think about God's law? And I'm not just talking to folks who aren't serious about the Bible, but those of us who really do believe the Bible and love the law of the Lord. Do you, do we want to follow it more than we want wealth? Is it sweeter than gold? Do you find more satisfaction in the Bible than in the best food? I think the answer is probably sometimes. You've had and I've had those moments when we say, yes, Lord, I will follow you in all your ways. But I suspect that like me, you don't always respond that way. We'll have undivided hearts in heaven, but we don't have them today, not yet. And what about the decrees of God, the times that he applies his law to your life directly? We can all say amen when he declares happy things for us, when our kids are healthy, when we're respected at work, and when life is just good. But what about when he says, I decree that you walk in this hard place, let go of rank, reputation, health, someone who's dear to you? What about when he says, I'm sending a pandemic, people you love may die, and years of your savings may disappear in a bear market? Do you say with David, the just decrees of the Lord are true and righteous altogether? That's hard, isn't it? Even when we, when we agree in our minds that God remains good, our hearts don't always follow willingly. Sometimes we say, actually, Lord, I'd rather have the gold and the honey. Loving the law of God isn't our first nature. The more we study it, the more we realize it's not always our deepest delight. Like Paul in Romans, 7, Romans 7, we say, I don't understand my own actions, for I have the desire to do what's right, but not the ability to carry it out. Paul loved God's law perhaps more than anyone who walked on the earth, and he saw the duplicity of his own heart, his conflicted desires, and we are just like Paul. We love God's law one day, and the next day we love the world. We act based on what we love. 
We know that we're guilty of breaking the law of God that we say we love many times and in many ways. If we really meditate on the law of God, if we're honest with ourselves, we should say with Peter, depart from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful man. Well, here is some very good news. This is why I was excited to bring this sermon. Even David, who loves God's law, has the same reaction. Note that he doesn't wrap up this psalm anticipating his great reward for his obedience. No, he knows, both in his own theology and from his firsthand experience, that even the deepest love of God's law isn't enough to keep him faithful to it. So this brings us to the third section of Psalm 19, and it's something of a crescendo. David started the psalm by praising God, having seen his glory in nature. Then he praised God, having seen God's wisdom in his law revealed in the scripture. Now he pleads with God to keep him from sin. He says in verse 12 that even he who loves God's law so much doesn't know how to obey perfectly. And he asks God to keep him from accidental sins against a holy God. But lest we think David or we only sin a little bit because we don't really mean any harm, verse 13 makes plain that without God's restraining grace, we will sin with a high hand. And David knows something deeply true about sin. It wants dominion over us. That's what he says there. Just as God said to Cain that sin was crouching at the door of his heart, desiring to rule him, and rule him it did, so David knows that he's no different. And brothers and sisters, neither are we. Whether you've walked with the Lord for decades or haven't even yet taken your first step of faith, sin wants you, and it's a harsh master. Don't miss what's going on here. David, who is the greatest king on the planet at the time, knows that he can become a slave in a moment. The king who has dominion over so much knows that it's only God's grace and mercy that keeps him from the dominion of sin. He says then, after God answers his prayer and keeps him from sins known and unknown, only then will he be innocent. And he knows that while the guilt of sin is on him, any hope he has of conquering sin can only come from God. And this brings us to the final verse in the psalm, and I want to spend our last minutes looking closely at it. In verse 14, David says, God, would you let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer? David, who has just pondered his sinfulness that isn't conquered even by his love of God's law, wants what we all want. He wants to be accepted by God. He says, God, accept me. Don't cast me away. Don't leave me to the world or to my own devices. Instead, be my rock and my redeemer. Well, how does this happen? How does God accept us? It's obviously not our goodness. We just saw how susceptible we are to falling into sin, whether inadvertently or arrogantly. It's obviously not our love of God's law. Because even when that love is strong and increasing, we still fail. Look at how many saints in the Bible failed. Adam ate forbidden fruit. Noah got drunk and humiliated himself. Abraham lied about his wife. David had Uriah killed to steal his wife. Peter betrayed Jesus. We could go on. No one can perfectly love God with his whole heart and soul and mind. Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount that not one of us really even obeys the Ten Commandments. No, there has to be another way to be acceptable to God, one that makes him happy with us despite all our sin and failure. David knew this. Listen to Luke 24, 44. This is Jesus speaking. He's talking to men who had abandoned him in fear and shame a few days earlier, his disciples at the crucifixion. To them, he says, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Now, if anyone said this today in 2020, we'd think him blasphemous or crazy or narcissistic. But this was Jesus who had just been raised from the dead. If you doubt that, by the way, if you doubt his resurrection, consider the fact that these men who had three days earlier fled at his crucifixion would all but one die violent deaths for nothing but their claims that he had been raised. It's not possible that they were all lying or deceived. No, Christ was raised. And he was bringing the kingdom of God to man, just as he said, and critically, just as the Psalms foretold. Remember, David didn't just write Psalm 19. He also wrote Psalm 2, which tells of the Lord's begotten son who would rule the nations and would bless those who take refuge in him. 
He wrote Psalm 16, where he says in verse 10 that God wouldn't let his Holy One see corruption. This was a promise that was fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus. David wrote Psalm 45, speaking of God as being on a throne, yet having been anointed by God, thereby introducing to us the idea of a Messiah who is God's son and yet is also very God himself. He wrote Psalm 69, the ninth verse of which the Apostle John tells us was a prophecy about Jesus' cleansing the temple. He wrote Psalm 110, which Jesus cites in Matthew 22 to silence his critics in a bold claim for his own divinity. All of these Psalms of David speak of a future king, a king even greater than David, a king whose throne will never end and whose rule will increase forever. This was David's hope for acceptance by God. This king wouldn't sin. This king's law, this love of God's law, would be unblemished and unbroken. Friends, we know that king, and we know that he brought us salvation and acceptance by God. This was actually prophesied in perhaps the most messianic psalm of all. Centuries before the practice of crucifixion had been conceived, David spoke in Psalm 22 of one whose hands and feet were pierced, who was mocked, and whose clothing was divided by cast lots. In fact, this psalm so clearly pointed forward to Jesus' death that some argued it was included in the Jewish Psalter by Jesus' followers after his death. That's an absurd claim, since Christ himself quoted that psalm on the cross, and you can't sneak a hymn into a hymn book of an entire nation a thousand years later. But that's how precise the prophecies in Psalm 22 were. The psalms have been called the Book of the Messiah. They cover every emotion, from exultation to despair, from certainty to confusion. And to every question, they answer, Jesus. David's reign would recede, but Jesus would sit on David's throne forever and ever. David would sin and fail, but Jesus would fulfill God's law perfectly. David shepherded Israel for a time, and then he died. But Psalm 23 tells us that the Lord will shepherd us even through the valley of the shadow of death. This is why David can pray that he would be acceptable in God's sight. Of himself, he knew he wasn't. He sinned, and he had to beg for forgiveness. And so do we. But he knew that his forgiveness was real and sure because of the Messiah he knew would come and the Messiah that we now worship. For those of you who know him and serve him, your lesson is this. Worship God for his goodness in the world and your life and love his law more tomorrow than today. Your sins are forgiven and you are accepted by God. For those of you who don't know him and serve him, today is the day. You can have what we all want deep in our souls, acceptance by God, forgiveness of sins, peace in your heart. Let's pray. Our great God, we thank you for the beauty of your world. Nature sings your praises and we add our voices as well. And we thank you for the beauty of your law. Your commandments are good and right and pure and true justice is found where you are. And above all, we thank you for your son, the one who rules your people with mercy and kindness forever, but who is coming to judge all men according to their deeds. May we be acceptable in your sight, Lord God, through Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen.